It is less than 500 years since an entire half of the world was discovered. It is less than 200 years since the discovery of the last continent. The sciences of chemistry and physics go back scarce one century. The science of aviation goes back 40 years. The science of atomics is being born. And yet we think we know a lot. We know little or nothing. Some of the most startling things are unknown to us. When they are discovered, they may shock us to the bone. We search for secrets in the far islands of the Pacific and among the ice fields of the frozen north, while under our very noses, rubbing shoulders with us every day, there may walk the undiscovered. It is a curious fact of nature that that which is in plain view is oft best hidden. I have always known of the man in the black cloak. Since I was a child, he's always lived on my street, and his eccentricities are so familiar that they go unmentioned, except among the casual visitor. Here in the heart of the largest city in the world, in swarming New York, the eccentric and the odd may flourish unhindered. As children we had hilarious fun, jeering at the man in black when he displayed his fear of women. We watched in our evil, childish way for those moments. We tried to get him to show anger, but he ignored us completely, and soon we paid him no further heed, even as our parents did. We saw him only twice a day, once in the early morning when we would see a six-foot figure come out of the grimy dark hallway of the tenement at the end of the street and stride down towards the elevated to work, again when he came back at night. He was always dressed in a long black cloak that came to his ankles, and he wore a wide-brimmed black hat far down over his face. He was a sight from some weird story out of the old lands. But he harmed nobody, and paid attention to nobody. Nobody except, perhaps, women. When a woman crossed his path, he would stop in his stride and come to a dead halt. We could see that he closed his eyes until she had passed. Then he would snap those wide, watery blue eyes open and march on as if nothing had happened. He was never known to speak to a woman. He would buy some groceries, maybe once a week at Antonio's, but only when there were no other patrons there. Antonio said once that he never talked, he just pointed at things he wanted and paid for them in bills that he pulled out of a pocket somewhere under his cloak. Antonio did not like him, but he never had any trouble with him either. Now that I think of it, nobody ever did have any trouble with him. We got used to him. We grew up on the street. We saw him occasionally when he came home and went back into the dark hallway of the house he lived in. One of the kids on the block lived in that house, too. A lot of families did. He said they knew nothing much about him either, though there were one or two funny stories. He never had visitors, he never spoke to anyone, and he had once built something in his room out of metal. He had then, years ago, hauled up some long, flat metal sheets, sheets of tin or iron, and they had heard a lot of hammering and banging in his room for several days. But that had stopped, and that was all there was to that story. Where he worked, I don't know, and never found out. He had money, for he was reputed to pay his rent regularly when the janitor asked for it. Well, people like that inhabit big cities, and nobody knows the story of their lives. Until they're all over. Or until something strange happens. I grew up. I went to college. I studied. Finally, I got a job assisting a museum curator. I spent my days mounting beetles and classifying exhibits of stuffed animals and preserved plants, and hundreds and hundreds of insects from all over. Nature is a strange thing, I learned. You learn that very clearly when you work in a museum. You realize how nature uses the art of camouflage. There are twig insects that look exactly like a leaf or a branch of a tree. Exactly. Even to having phony vein markings that look just like the real leaves. You can't tell them apart unless you look very carefully. Nature is strange and perfect that way. There's a moth in Central America that looks like a wasp. It even has a fake stinger made of hair, 
which it twists and curls just like a wasp's stinger. It has the same colorings, and even though its body is soft and not armored like a wasp's, it is colored to appear shiny and armored. It even flies in the daytime when wasps do, and not at night like all the other moths. It moves like a wasp. It knows somehow that it is helpless and that it can survive only by pretending to be as deadly to other insects as wasps are. I learned about army ants and their strange imitators. Army ants travel in huge columns of thousands and hundreds of thousands. They move along in a flowing stream several yards across, and they eat everything in their path. Everything in the jungle is afraid of them. Wasps, bees, snakes, other ants, birds, lizards, beetles, even men run away or get eaten. But in the midst of the army ants, there also travel many other creatures, creatures that aren't ants at all, and that the army ants would kill if they knew of them. But they don't know of them, because these other creatures are disguised. Some of them are beetles that look like ants. They have false markings like ant thoraxes, and they run along in imitation of ant speed. There's even one that is so long it is marked like three ants in single file. It moves so fast the real ants never give it a second glance. There are weak caterpillars that look like big armored beetles. There are all sorts of things that look like dangerous animals. Animals that are the killers and superior fighters of their groups have no enemies. The army ants and the wasps, the sharks, the hawk, and the felines. So there are a host of weak things that try to hide among them, to mimic them. And man is the greatest killer, the greatest hunter of them all. The whole world of nature knows man for the irresistible master. The roar of his gun, the cunning of his trap, the strength and agility of his arm place all else beneath him. Should man, then, be treated by nature differently than the other dominants, the army ants and the wasps? It was, as often happens to be the case, sheer luck that I happened to be on the street at that dawning hour when the janitor came running out of the tenement on my street shouting for help. I'd been working all night mounting new exhibits. The policeman on the beat and I were the only people besides the janitor to see the thing that we found in the two dingy rooms occupied by the stranger of the black cloak. The janitor explained, as the officer and I dashed up the narrow, rickety stairs, that he had been awakened by the sound of heavy thuds and shrill screams in the stranger's rooms. He had gone out in the hallway to listen. Severe groaning, as of someone in terrible pain, the noise of someone thrashing around in agony was coming from behind the closed door of the stranger's apartment. The janitor had listened, then run for help. When we got there, the place was silent. A faint light shone from under the doorway. The policeman knocked. There was no answer. He put his ear to the door, and so did I. We heard a faint rustling, a continuous, slow rustling as of a breeze blowing paper. The cop knocked again, but there was still no response. Then, together, we threw our weight at the door. Two hard blows and the rotten old lock gave way. We burst in. The room was filthy. The floor covered with scraps of torn paper, bits of detritus and garbage. The room was unfurnished, which I thought was odd. In one corner there stood a metal box about four feet square, a tight box held together with screws and ropes. It had a lid opening at the top, which was down and fastened with a sort of wax seal. The stranger of the black cloak lay in the middle of the floor, dead. He was still wearing the cloak. The big slouch hat was lying on the floor some distance away. From the inside of the box the faint rustling was coming. We turned over the stranger, took the cloak off. For several instants we saw nothing amiss. At first we saw a man, dressed in a somber, featureless black suit. He had a coat and skin-tight pants. His hair was short and curly brown. It stood straight up in its inch-long length. His eyes were open and staring. I noticed first that he had no eyebrows, only a curious dark line in the flesh over each eye. It was then 
that I realized he had no nose. But no one had ever noticed that before. His skin was oddly mottled. Where the nose should have been, there were dark shadowings that made the appearance of a nose, if you only just glanced at him, like the work of a skillful artist in a painting. His mouth was as it should be, and slightly open, but he had no teeth. His head perched upon a thin neck. The suit was not a suit. It was part of him. It was his body. What we thought was a coat was a huge black wing sheath, like a beetle has. He had a thorax like an insect. Only the wing sheath covered it, and you couldn't notice it when he wore the cloak. The body bulged out below, tapering off into the two long, thin hind legs. His arms came out from under the top of the coat. He had a tiny, secondary pair of arms folded tightly across his chest. There was a sharp, round hole, newly pierced in his chest just above these arms, still oozing a watery liquid. The janitor fled, gibbering. The officer was pale but standing by his duty. I heard him muttering under his breath an endless stream of Hail Marys. The lower thorax, the abdomen, was very long and insect-like. It was crumpled up now, like the wreck of an airplane fuselage. I recalled the appearance of a female wasp that had just laid eggs. Her thorax had had that empty appearance. The sight was a shock such as leaves one in full control. The mind rejects it, and it's only an afterthought that one can feel the dim shudder of horror. The rustling was still coming from the box. I motioned to the white-faced cop, and we went over and stood before it. He took his nightstick and knocked away the waxen seal. Then we heaved and pulled the lid open. A wave of noxious vapor assailed us. We staggered back as suddenly a stream of flying things shot out of the huge iron container. The window was open, and straight out into the first glow of dawn they flew. There must have been dozens of them. They were about two or three inches long, and they flew on wide, gauzy beetle wings. They looked like little men, strangely terrifying as they flew, clad in their black suits with expressionless faces and their dots of watery blue eyes, and they flew out on transparent wings that came from under their black beetle coats. I ran to the window, fascinated, almost hypnotized. The horror of it had not reached my mind at once. Afterwards, I have had spasms of numbing terror as my mind tries to put the things together. The whole business was so utterly unexpected. We knew of army ants and their imitators, yet it never occurred to us that we too were army ants of a sort. We knew of stick insects, and it never occurred to us that there might be others that disguise themselves to fool not other animals, but the supreme animal himself, man. We found some bones in the bottom of that iron case afterwards, but we couldn't identify them. Perhaps we did not try very hard. They might have been human. I suppose the stranger of the black cloak did not fear women so much as it distrusted them. Women notice men, perhaps more closely than other men do. Women might become suspicious sooner of the inhumanity, the deception. And then there might have perhaps have been some touch of instinctive feminine jealousy. The stranger was disguised as a man, but its sex was surely female. The things in the iron box were its young. But it is the other thing I saw when I ran to the window that has shaken me the most. The policeman did not see it. Nobody else saw it but me, and I only for an instant. Nature practices deceptions in every angle. Evolution will create a being for any niche, no matter how unlikely. When I went to the window, I saw the small cloud of flying things rising up into the sky and sailing away into the purple distance. The dawn was breaking, and the first rays of the sun were just striking over the housetops. Shaken, I looked away from that fourth-floor tenement room over the roofs of lower buildings. Chimneys and walls and empty clotheslines made the scenery over which the tiny mass of horror passed. And then I saw a chimney, not thirty feet away on the next roof. It was squat 
and red brick and had two black pipe ends flush with its top. I saw it suddenly vibrate oddly, and its red brick surface seemed to peel away, and the black pipe openings turned suddenly white. I saw two big eyes staring into the sky. A great, flat-winged thing detached itself silently from the surface of the real chimney and darted after the cloud of flying things. I watched until all had lost themselves in the sky.